Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Royal Society of Victoria for tonight's lecture, very special lecture and panel discussion. Uh, my name's Rob Gill. It's my pleasure to be the president of the Royal Society of Victoria. Uh, so welcome to you all, whether you're here in the Royal Society of Victoria's Ellery Theatre in person or via Zoom uh, on the webinar or live streamed via YouTube. Welcome to everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, we acknowledge that all of us are located on the traditional traditional lands of the state's first scientists, the many different First Nations people uh, who belong to the diverse lands and waters of what we now call Victoria. We're coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri of the Wurrung uh, and invite everyone joining us tonight online, either via the uh, Zoom webinars chat function or YouTube's comments section to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land from which you are this evening and join me in paying respects to the elders past and present and likewise we extend that respect to any uh, Indigenous Australians who've joined us in the meeting tonight. This evening we have a joint presentation uh, between the Society and two of our national academies, the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering and the Australian Academy of Science. And I extend a very warm welcome to our friends and colleagues from those uh, academies who have joined us uh, either in the room or some perhaps online as well. It's National Science Week. We had a terrific opening of National Science Week at Museum Victoria just up the hill last Thursday night. Uh, and our three organisations actually grouped together and wanted to do something a little bit more special this year, including inviting uh, Ms Tegan Taylor uh, to be our MC tonight for this uh, presentation. And a very important one it is. Science, Media and the Law, Lessons from the Kathleen, Fol Kathleen Folbig Case. Tegan, of course, is a multi-award winning health and science reporter for the ABC. She hosts uh, shows including Radio National's Health, health Report, Quick Smart and What's That Rash. Uh, which you, you, need to, you need to listen to What's That Rash? We, uh, and it's replayed valuably as well, isn't it, Tegan? Yeah. RSV members that will be filling with Tegan as the uh, most recent host of ABC's Occam's Razor podcast, which we've often hosted here at the Society. Uh, she's received a Walkley Award and Eureka Prize for Science Journalism, and her work appeared in the Best of Australian Science Writing. So with that, uh, please join me in making our uh, MC for the evening, Ms Tegan Taylor, very welcome. Thank you so much and thanks for having me and thank you all for coming out or joining us on a Wednesday night because we're dealing with something a bit heavy tonight, honestly, one of the hardest topics imaginable with layers of insult and injustice over injury. The Kathleen Folbig case is one that has been so publicised over such a long period of time that the details almost roll off the tongue now but before we delve into matters of science and the law, let's just remind ourselves what we're talking about tonight. To lose a child, a baby, is unspeakably sad and to lose four defies any kind of resilience. And then to be accused of causing those deaths, being convicted and then serving 20 years in prison, there just aren't words for it. But that's what happened to Kathleen Folbig. Between 1989 and 1999, each of her four infant children died. In the legal proceedings that followed, the prosecution leaned heavily on the now discredited Meadows Law, the idea that one sudden infant death in a family is a tragedy, two is suspicious, and three or more is murder until proven otherwise. Kathleen was convicted of murder, manslaughter and grievous bodily harm and went to prison in 2003. But while the case against her was always circumstantial, in the years that followed, scientific and medical research further pointed towards her innocence, suggesting a genetic cause of the deaths. And in 2020, 90 eminent Australian scientists and medical professionals, led by the Australian Academy of Science, petitioned the New South Wales Governor to pardon her. Finally, in 2023, Kathleen was pardoned and then acquitted. It's an outcome that wouldn't have been possible without the work of a team that advocated for her, Team Folbig, as well as the backing of the scientific community. So as well as being a long-awaited reprieve for Kathleen, the case represents a legal flashpoint, a moment for science, and it provides a blueprint for, to help avoid future injustices. So we're going to look at it in detail tonight. We'll hear from some of the key people in the Kathleen Folbig case including Peter Yates, who spearheaded Team Folbig, Anna Maria Arabia, the Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science, and Kathleen's lifelong friend and advocate, Tracy Chapman. 
We'll also gain insights from David Balding, a geneticist with plenty of experience in giving scientific evidence in court, both here in Australia and overseas. It is a huge topic. We will do our best to cover the sorts of things that you're likely to want to know about, that there also will be some time for question and answers at the end. And to start us off with an overview, I'd like to welcome a man not contented with being at the forefront of just one sector. He's a leader in financial stewardship, science and the not-for-profit sector, and he was instrumental in Kathleen Folbig's case, as we're about to hear. Please welcome Dr Peter Yates. Thank you, Tegan, and uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank Matthew Cuthbertson uh, for initiating this. It was sort of his idea, but I understand there were others involved as well. Um, and for Mike Flattery for getting us together. Uh, Rob Jell, your chairman, thank you very much indeed. Uh, other panellists, experts and uh, audience in the room um, and online. Just before I begin, though, uh, our Indigenous community have been acknowledged. Um, so I'd like to add my acknowledgements and thank, uh, give my thanks and acknowledge those who serve in the armed forces and keep us secure, those who serve in our essential services and keep us safe, our creator, thank all of our religious organisations for the work they do in our society, and after all, this is the Royal Society, so I'd like to acknowledge King Charles, who is our sovereign. Being involved with Kathleen's tragic journey has been one of the most challenging and rewarding matters I've actually ever taken on. Uh, and I think you know my background. I was at Macquarie Bank for 20 years. I ran Kerry Packers Empire. I bid for Qantas. Uh, I now chair the second largest life insurance company in the country. I chair the risk committee for, uh, for Linfox. Uh, that's probably well known. You've seen a couple of trucks around. And I chair the investment committee for Mutual Trust, which is the largest wealth management uh, private uh, family, multifamily office in the country. So I've done a few things along the way, um, but I can guarantee you that being involved in Kathleen's tragic journey has been one of the most challenging. Because Kathleen is a beautiful woman who lost her four children to a complex illness. They were in, in fact, they were all a bit younger than my grandchildren. I've got two gorgeous grandchildren, uh, two young, uh, young girls. Uh, but instead of being able to grieve for her losses, she was confronted with the full institutional force of the New South Wales Police, the judiciary, the prison system, and an extremely hostile Attorney General's office. Now, how Kath has survived this ordeal is a story in its own right. I mean, it is the great story of resilience. Uh, uh, but tonight, we're actually taking you on our journey. Um, uh, this is Team Folbig up here, um, and this is the journey I'm going to take you through. But what I can happily share with you is that Kath is doing remarkably well. I speak with her most weeks. Uh, she's enjoying her life. She's getting on with her life. Uh, and when, and I know, well, obviously Tracy's here as well. She speaks with her probably every day. But I, I sit back there and say, how can this extraordinary woman um, be so upbeat, so positive, so grateful, so, uh, so gracious, um, but she is, uh, she is a truly remarkable woman. Now, that's just to um, pick up a couple of points that was raised before. So first of all, we now know, because we, we've got all the backstory, right? I mean, we have got thousands and thousands of pages of information. A lot of it's confidential. It's never, ever been made public. What we do know, though, was Kathleen was actually targeted by the New South Wales Police. Um, uh, so there was, a, there was a specific target taken out on Kathleen's head for a reason we don't quite know, but we know that she was targeted. Um, she was, uh, uh, and without any evidence to suggest that she actually did anything, because after all, three of her children had had incredibly poor health, epileptic fits, been in and out of hospital, you know. Th th this weren't, these weren't four healthy babies that, you know, she just whacked. That's rubbish. These were incredibly uh, ill kids, except for one. So they targeted her. The second thing, and this is where Meadows Law should have applied, because she was actually prosecuted by the same chief prosecutor of the New South Wales, Mark Tedeschi, who's subsequently been found on two other occasions, to, in, in high profile cases, to have improperly or in. I, incorrectly prosecuted two other very high-profile cases, one of which was the Hilton bombing case, so you would know that. 
Now, you know, Meadows Law, once is bad luck, twice is unbelievable, three times is incredible. So we know no Hilton bombing, there's another case, and Kathleen Fobig. Now, I mean, just let's imagine that. That's where, uh, that's where Meadows Law should apply. Um, uh, she was in prison then for 20 years, of which most of that time she spent in isolation for her own safety. Now, child killers are prison scum, and she became fully aware of the consequences of this terrible title. And, and we will discover, and it will become public, exactly what happened to Kathleen in prison. Uh, then, after 15 years, she was granted a purportedly independent inquiry. Now, you need to understand the judicial system in, in, in our world, in the Western democracy, we have judiciary, we have parliament, and we have executive. They're the separation, and then, of course, the fourth estate is the media. Um, the, the, the judicial system in New South Wales had come to an end in terms of what it was going to do to appeal. So there was no route for Kathleen to appeal any further. So it required the executive branch of government to run what's called an independent inquiry. Now let's just think about this. So Mark Speakman, the Attorney General, who did he appoint to run this inquiry? Very fine name, uh, very fine justice. Uh, by the way, that person had been the CEO of the DPP before he became a justice. And Mark Speakman appointed uh, Justice Blanche to review the case. Now, the case was run, as I said, by Mark Dedeski. Mark Dedeski was appointed by Justice Blanche to be Justice Blanche's deputy. Now, I'm from the business world. Imagine your Volkswagen and you've had this terrible situation of you know, uh, false evidence, and the government of Germany appoints the former chairman of Volkswagen to review the conduct of the CEO. I mean, hard to imagine. Um, <clears throat> and that inquiry concluded that the judge was even more certain of Kathleen's crime than the original trial. And th th that inquiry used Kath's diaries to make this conclusion. Now, he did so without wanting to know why she wrote the diaries or what the words actually meant to her. In his opening comments, he dismissed the, anything in the diaries other than effectively uh, evidence of her own conviction. Oh, and by the way, just let's hold, flow back a second, step back a second. If I hadn't told you this took place in New South Wales, Australia, you might have think that this took place in some communist, you know, uh, uh, communist or, uh, uh, or other, you know, <laughs> dictatorial environment, but no, this happened in New South Wales in Australia. Um, in addition, it happened under the watchful eye of some 15 members of the New South Wales judiciary were involved in reaching various different decisions about Kathleen. Uh, three High Court judges were involved and three Attorneys General. Um, I would ask each of us to reflect on what happened. It's shocking. Imagine if Kath was your sister, friend or neighbour. I mean, just think about that set of circumstances. And by the way, this is Australia and this is New South Wales. Um, it's just appalling. Um, now, how did we, how did we uh, manage this? Well, first of all, it began through true, true friendship from Tracy. Without Tracy, none of us would be here telling this story. Uh, it was also the grit determined of, of Corolla Vinuesa, the coming together of the best science, uh, which we've never seen before, engagement from the Academy of Science, and also through the incredible uh, PR team we had from GRA Cosway and the national media team uh, from, uh, from the Academy of Science and of course with a social media campaign run by Tracy. Now we came together in this incredibly effective team. Here is Team Folbig uh, and we managed to wrench open the Attorney General's office using tactics more commonly found, which I used to use in my days when I raided corporate entities. Uh, so hostile takeovers, uh, which I've done quite a few of, uh, but we used scientific skill, media network and pl political pressure. And of course we had a committed legal team and that's how we uh, righted the, the Australia's worst judicial wrongdoing. Now we are going to talk about things that could be changed in due course, but some people have asked me, well how did I become involved? Well here's Team Folbig. <laughs> And that's because at my 60th birthday, I decided I'd like to have five presentations for things that I was interested in. I had Baroness Greenfield come down from uh, the UK to talk on Alzheimer's. 
Uh, I work with her. I, had, I, I asked Michelle Simmons, who heads up the Centre for Quantum Computing, which I chair, to come and talk about quantum computing. I asked Carola Vinuesa, I chair the Centre for Personalised Immunology, which is rare genetic disorders, and so she was my CEO, and I had a couple of other people come and speak. And so Carola decided that I had, of course, you know, I had a couple of hundred friends there, and I'm very lucky to have that many friends. Maybe they knew that booze was going to be good, whatever, they all came along. Um, and, and Carola made her pitch to that group. She explained to us the Kathleen Folbig story, how she'd been involved, how in the first inquiry she'd been effectively trashed uh, by the process, how upset she was, and we thought about this. And you know, a few of us got together afterwards and said, there's just something wrong here, you know. I mean, you know, maybe the desire to do something when you turn 60 is the right, moment, right motivation. But we were shocked. And then I read the, uh, uh, Carolla's transcript in the inquiry where she was subjected to a withering interrogation by counsel assisting Gail Finesse. I, I've had the privilege of being um, cross-examined for three days uh, in, a in a court case that I was involved in, and that was a very, very harrowing experience, but that was a legal case, it was a commercial matter. Uh, if you actually read Carolla's transcript from the withering interrogation she was given, you'd think this was, you know, this was a prosecution. It was not, it was actually an inquiry. Uh, so I read that and thought, gee, something's wrong here. And then I actually then read the trial uh, and I thought, this is impossible to believe. This is nuts. Uh, and so we got together, a few of us got together, and then with the Academy of Science, thanks to Anna Marie Arabia and the CEO at the time, John Shine, we decided to support this idea of the petition. Now, the petition was signed, we're about to release it, and we thought to ourselves, hang on a second. If that doesn't cause the Attorney General's office door to be opened, then science itself has been dismissed and there's no chance of recovery for uh, Kathleen, that's it. So we backed off a second and we said, okay, let's bring in the Australian media industry. Uh, obviously, as you know, I said before, I used to run Kerry Packer's Empire. I've got a few friends left in the media industry. Uh, the Australian Science Media Centre that I chair, we have the gatekeepers from News, Channel 9, ABC sitting on our board, and Caroline McMillan knows all too well about that, the Academy of Science, the Royal Institution. So we said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to launch an absolutely an atomic bomb on the Attorney General's office in a media sense. So we lined up uh, News Corp. Uh, who very kindly decided every single front page of every single News Corp paper in the country carried the petition. Um, Channel 9 carried it across all of their news, all their main coverage. The Royal Institution had separate articles going. The Science Media Centre distributed nationally and internationally. Uh, and what that meant is for the very first time, the Attorney General's office realised that uh, they were now dealing with something of deep power and deep influence. Because when you're the Attorney General's office or the DPP, you have huge power with the media. Because, you know, you can get a little... If, if the Attorney General's office or the DPP give you as a media uh, organisation a little bit of a leak about something pretty exciting, then you've got content which makes it valuable. So you always want to keep on side of the DPP or the Attorney General's office. So, so they always have a huge advantage in terms of managing processes. Uh, then the second thing is we had to do is we decided that we needed to change the public narrative from the idea that Kath was a child killer to the fact that Kath was a tragic case of an innocent mum who'd been in, improperly incarcerated. And that required a continued media campaign uh, to change public perception. Because to get the Attorney General's office to spend the taxpayers' money to do a second inquiry required a change in the public opinion. And through the, uh, through the efforts of GRA Cosway, uh, who, who did actual polling um, across different cities at different times, we knew how our message was going and we were successful in, in, in getting public sentiment changed. On this occasion, we had a absolutely top gun legal team. Previously, Kathleen hadn't had really uh, open to her uh, the quality of the legal team that we now were able, she was now able to enjoy. That makes a big difference. Um, and Robert Kavanagh and Rani Rego and the wider legal minds pulled off something that was absolutely incredible. Then the political stages. Well, the Peritet government was struggling, and as the Attorney General, Mark Speakman was, you know, sort of rumbling a little bit as to who was going to get to what, as you know, Mark Speakman is now the leader of the opposition. So there were some internal issues going on, but through media pressure, we put the AG to make a decision and not hide the process. So then as the months and months elapsed without any decision, uh, 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 we decided to apply pressure uh, to get a decision uh, up. I then met with John Sharp, 
uh, he's actually was the, was the, was the member, uh, the federal member of parliament, also chairman of Rex, but he'd been the person who had discovered how to get Lindy Chamberlain out of jail. And so he suggested some political processes, and guess what? From then on in, every single time the Liberal government met as a, as a party for a major fundraiser, um, funds were given and, and questions were asked in those, all in front of Cabinet as to why Kathleen was not out of jail. So we managed to continue to do this, um, and each anniversary event, uh, each anniversary incarceration, her birthday, her jail milestones, we kept the media running. Now, in the meantime, we decided that we must plan for success. Uh, and so we engaged, <coughs> because in Australia, if, you, if we were gonna be successful, we knew Kathleen's story would be valuable, and that value we needed to capture for her, so she started her life with something in her bank, because after 20 years, there was nothing. So we engaged Nick Fordham. Nick Fordham and Fordham Enterprises is the most famous, you, you think of a story you've ever heard of in Australia, he's probably done it for you and, and, and maximised the media sales. So finally the dam broke, second inquiry was announced, and of course uh, uh, we, we, we then had the Attorney General come out saying, well basically he didn't want to have to do this, but he felt he had to, it was awful he had to do it, waste of taxpayers' money, but he had to do it. You know, he was really disgruntled about doing this. Now, <clears throat> we thought, okay, great, he's going to spend $4 million on his legal team, we should get a little bit, absolutely, as little as possible, wouldn't even pay for Rani. Rani and Robert live in Newcastle, they wouldn't even pay for them to stay in Sydney. They said, oh no, you can drive to and from Newcastle every day of the trial, there's no reason for you to have accommodation expenses in Sydney. So at this point in time, I thought, right, uh, we went out to all of our financial uh, industry friends, high net wealths, and said, right, we need to raise money because we needed to raise the money not only for that, but also to get the five scientists that we needed in the trial who were all overseas to come in evidence in person. Uh, <coughs> so we were able to do that. And because the science came through in the inquiry, because the scientists were there in person, because those scientists were able to explain, not on a Zoom call on the wrong time of day in a different part of the world, and by the way, the technology out of that court is okay, but there was plenty of times when the Zoom call went down. We paid to have all those scientists brought down from England, London, Europe, America. We paid for all their accommodation so that her story and the science behind her story could be properly told. So. Kath got released, she was acquitted, um, and we successfully sold her story, uh, the first instalment, and that's enabled her to have some financial means to begin her new life. And that's why each time I talk to her, I know that she's in reasonable accommodation, she's got a reasonable life, uh, but of course there's still another stage to go in this process, which is the state of New South Wales needs to decide how they wish to apologise to Kathleen, and it ain't gonna be just an apology. <laughs> Words are cheap for what Kathleen has, uh, has, has, uh, has succumbed to. Um, so what needs to change? Well, I think there's gonna be a further discussion about this. The use of purely circumstantial evidentiary procedures, which is what happened in those three cases uh, that I referred to, the ability to have a process to, to have a criminal review that is not controlled by the Attorney General's office and of course different methods for experts to be vetted. Um, it's been an incredible journey. I've been very fortunate um, uh, of the people that I've worked with, Anna Maria, Rabia, Tracy, the legal team, um, and uh, thank you for listening to the story. And over to you, Anna Maria. Thank you, Peter. Look, I've never been involved in a corporate takeover, but I feel somewhat primed um, after the <laughs> Team Folbig experience. Thank you. Um, you. You may not know it, but you've got the scoop on Team Folbig. Um, this is the first time um, I think it's been spoken about in so much detail and the behind the scenes work that happened. Um, I just want to start with a few things. Happy Science Week, everyone. Um, this is the week where we remember that we shouldn't take for granted science and scientists and that you got here because of science, whether you flew, drew, drove or <laughs> took public transport, you registered because of science and we're likely to live longer because of it. So um, yay to science um, and it's well worth celebrating this week and every day of the year actually. Um, I've... I'm Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science and I have the great privilege uh, to oversee the contribution um, of our fellowship, which is 600 of Australia's most distinguished scientists 
and they come together and offer their expertise, their time and their energy um, and all of the evidence that they bring to bear for us to use at the Australian Academy of Science to then bring it to decision makers in the hope of overturning um, things like this or bringing, bringing evidence to decision making, which is critically important. Um, I'd like to acknowledge David Balding, Professor David Balding, who's a fellow of the Academy of Sciences with, with us tonight. Um, and it's an absolute honour to be able to share uh, this event with Tracy Chapman, who sets a standard in advocacy, friendship and support. There is, she really shows the world what that looks like. Good on you, Tracy. Um, and of course, Peter Yates, uh, who is an Academy medalist. To be an Academy medalist, you're one of a handful of people in Australia who have made a profound contribution to science from outside of the scientific world. And Peter is um, a, a very um, proud, and uh, we're very proud to have him as an Academy medalist. Um, so we are able to draw on the brains trust of the nation uh, to translate their work into meaningful and accessible knowledge. <coughs> Um, so, you know, one of the things I've learned in, in working with scientists and gathering their evidence is that the more volatile our world becomes, the more uncertain it becomes, the more we need science and the more we need to be able to draw on science to guide our actions and our decisions. And this was absolutely evident in the Kathleen Folby case. Um, and it was indeed a great privilege to be able to participate in it. Um, the Academy was um, uh, appointed as an independent scientific advisor to the Kathleen, the second inquiry into Kathleen's um, convictions. And I'll go through some of that today. We worked, as Peter said, with Team Folbig, um, and, and the great talent uh, that was that, and we're responsible for very painfully, but could I say elegantly, extracting that second inquiry out of the New South Wales um, justice system, uh, because it wasn't an easy thing to extract, to be fair. Um, it offers a fantastic demonstration case of how science and the law should interact and how things could be done better in the future. And a, an absolutely extraordinary example of how science and scientists fought to be heard in a legal system that is currently ill-equipped uh, to deal with the pace of scientific and technological change. Um, and, and of course, let's not forget in all of this, in Peter's description of everything that went on behind the scenes, at the core of this is a woman a mother who lost four children and was wrongfully incarcerated for 20 years. And I'm always reminded of how unimaginable that must be. Um, and I think was very much um, a driving force in everything uh, that we did. So lots of people have asked me why the Academy got involved. Um, we got involved because we're all about bringing evidence to decisions. And this is no different. We're often associated with bringing evidence to our parliament and to assisting the decisions of ministers, um, but bringing it to the justice system is something that is equally important. Uh, we became involved in um, 2019, 2020. I won't go through it all, but of course, you know, this started a lot earlier in 2003. The first inquiry was in 2019. So, uh, and it was in October, 2019 that uh, Professor Carolla Vinwaiser, another extraordinary fellow of the Academy of Science, called me and then come to see me about this case. And I must admit, when she first took me through it, I said, Carolla, are you sure? Like, you know, justice system doesn't get it wrong all that often. Um, you know, have, have, you know, have you got all of the detail? And we were naturally sceptical, as scientists should be sceptical. Um, but it's fair to say that the closer we looked at the evidence and uh, the way this um, entire case had been conducted, the more we became concerned. But from our perspective, the perspective of the Australian Academy of Science, we were particularly concerned uh, by science not being heard in that first inquiry in 2019. Uh, Carolla delivered science, she delivered evidence, and it was dismissed. And I'll go through some of the ways that that happened um, and, and what we did. Um, so we were appointed a um, independent scientific advisor um, in that second in inquiry, I'll, I'll come back to the journey to get there uh, in, in a moment. And what does that mean? We were involved in the independent selection of experts. So we were able to literally look at where the experts were across the world in the correct sub-disciplines to be able to give the most up-to-date and best scientific evidence to that inquiry so it could be heard. 
uh, we, were, we assisted the inquiry in asking the right questions to the right experts. So one of the features of the first inquiry was that some people who were not fully qualified in, this, in the specific sub-discipline were asked questions outside of their field, and therefore the best available evidence wasn't given. So it was about getting the right questions to the right experts. Uh, we helped um, council assisting where, we need, where they needed to clarify some of the technical and scientific information, so where there were clarifications and in, uh, needed because of inconsistency we were able to work with them to help guide their questions or suggest what their questions might look like so that they could uh, work through some of the inconsistencies and get a good hold of the science. Um, we didn't have, importantly, we weren't a party to the inquiry in that we weren't able to cross-examine witnesses ourselves, and that was a good thing. Uh, we acted independently and separately to assist council assisting um, with, their, with their work. Um, this next slide shows... Um, some photos of two Danish scientists, um, Michael Toft Overgaard and Mette Nygaard. Um, and Peter mentioned that there was fundraising efforts to get people like those two scientists to Australia. Um, and that it was a six hour cross-examination. Uh, it didn't feel hostile, it didn't feel very adversarial because it was a deeply engaging discussion between uh, the inquirer, um, uh, Bathurst, uh, council assisting, and these two scientists, and indeed the other scientists who were put before the inquiry. For six hours, they took the inquiry through what the mutations held by Kathleen Folbig and her, her two daughters meant. They started with evolutionary biology and they ended in today's most up-to-date knowledge. It is by far and remains for me one of the most extraordinary um, demonstrations of science communication and facilitation of science in a justice setting that I have ever seen in my life. I'd go as far as saying it should be compulsory viewing for every science law and medical student in the country. It was really something. Now, it's not available anywhere yet. We might be able to get that out of the New South Wales justice system. Um, but they really did explain why it's so rare and novel to have a calmodulin mutation and why when you do have one, you're likely to have cardiac arrhythmias. And when that does happen, you might die. Um, and so they they were able to explain that so um, in such a sophisticated way. It was really a, a moment of brilliance. Uh, I can go into some of the detail of the calmodular mutation later. I won't in the interest of time, but if there are questions, I'm happy to take them later. Why do we need independent scientific advisors? You know, don't we have prosecution and defence putting forward um, experts all the time? We do, but things go wrong. And some of the reasons we need um, independent scientific advisors is because uh, there is great misuse of statistics in our courts. Uh, David Balding will be able to speak to that later. Um, you know, in Kathleen's case, there was this reliance on the discredited Meadows Law, which we've heard about. Uh, this happens time and time again. Prosecution often chooses experts, often um, because they're the people they know, they're good performers, they know that in interrogating them, they can get to a certain point and that's where it ends. Defence often don't have the resources to be able to come back or even to identify experts to bring forward. So an independent advisor would be able to um, overcome some of that. Um, uh, Often the methodology of science and, and, and the rigour that is behind scientific methodology is not well explored, um, and, and some expert evidence isn't sought at all, and we'll see that um, in the Kathleen Fobby case in just a moment. Uh, so ignore the bit on the, on the left, um, but effectively this was a transcript out of the uh, 2021 appeal, and it referred to the first inquiry. Um, but there were a couple of things here. There was uh, the, the scientific rigour did not exist in this case. So science was not in any way being heard accurately or sufficiently. Uh, so there is this thing called the International Calmodulant Calmodulinopathy Register, and that is all of the cases of people with calmodulin mutations around the world. Um, and so the interpretation of that register was incorrect in, this, um, in the conclusions of this appeal. Um, there was preference given to circumstantial evidence, so the diaries that Kathleen kept, rather than scientific data, which just doesn't stack up in a scientific sense. And the conclusions were all based on the premise that there needed to be one unifying cause of death, that, that those four children could not have possibly died from different individuals individual causes of death, which is absolutely incorrect scientifically and, and should never have been um, allowed to happen. I won't go into complete detail, but let me just give you a couple of examples from here. Um, the experts who were examined, who were cross-examined in the first inquiry were asked uh, whether they knew of any children who had died under the age of two, and they said, nope, didn't know of any. Um, 
the register has children who died under the age of two. They, asked, they were asked if they knew of any children who had suffered from cardiac arrhythmias because of calmodulin mutations um, when they were asleep as opposed to during exercise or exertion. No, it didn't, when the register does actually contain those. Uh, there were questions raised about how could it be possible that Kathleen is alive and well when it's hereditary and, and, and the children have the, this mutation when it's understood genetically that that is absolutely consistent and possible. Um, so these inconsistencies were littered right throughout that first inquiry. They were inaccurate. And the experts who were presented to that inquiry did not do this maliciously, I'm sure of it, but they were not the right experts in the right field. They simply did not have the knowledge to present accurate science to that inquiry and decisions were made that were wrong. And Kathleen spent another three years in prison as a consequence. Um, and then, of course, there were the diary entries. Now, in that first inquiry, um, uh, the inquirer, Reginald Blanche, um, said that he could read the diaries, so he knew what they meant. Uh, he refused uh, any psychologist or psychiatrist to come forward as a, as a witness, I flat out re refused that. Um, they are scientific experts in their own right. So yet circumstantial evidence was put above scientific evidence um, to Kathleen's uh, detriment. Um, and as I said, she went on to um, spend another three years in jail. Uh, she was accused of suffocating her children. There was never any pathological or medical evidence of, of suffocation. It was littered with inaccuracies. So some of, these are some of the wonderful people who came forward. Um, and signed a petition uh, to petition the Governor of New South Wales to say, uh, to, to ask for a mercy plea to have Kathleen freed. And it was that and everything Peter has told you that went around that. Um, uh, and, and of course, Peter and Team Folbig bought all of that strategy and wonderful work. And we gathered uh, the scientists who looked at scientific publications that were in the public domain by this stage and saw that the evidence was overwhelming, um, that those calmodular mutations were reasonable causes of death of the two girls and there were medical um, explanations for the other children. Uh, so the petition went forward. We finally extracted that second inquiry um, and, and, and you know the, the rest. Um, so what have we learnt from this? From the Australian Academy of Sciences perspective, there are three important law reform opportunities that we are focusing on and seeking to bring about. Now, the system is slow, uh, but we are, we are fighters, you've probably figured out. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll only go through them very briefly in the interest of time, but ha happy to take questions. So one of them is the introduction of a reliability standard for the admissibility of evidence. What does that mean? So when evidence comes into a courtroom, there is no standard, there is no reliability standard that it is judged against. So often, suspicions, opinion, things that have no basis in science are admitted as evidence. And juries, who may not have know any better, take that as evidence and consider it in their deliberations and their thinking, and people's lives are impacted. We need a reliability standard for the admission of evidence. It needs to be introduced in the Commonwealth Evidence Act and then translated into all the state and territory acts. The second is a mechanism to select experts um, who are independent and by reliable sources. This is the role the Academy played in the Kathleen Folby case. It doesn't have to be a role for the Academy to play in all of the justice system, but an independent body that would be able to say, these experts are the best possible that you could bring to this case, whatever that case might be. And it won't be every case in the country. There would have to be a threshold. Um, and that would allow the best possible experts to be coming forward. It would also stop, I think it would also remove some of that hyper adversarial um, uh, environment that experts uh, currently um, participate in. So many of our scientists say that they hate giving evidence and they would prefer to never do it again. They feel cornered, they feel unable to give full an answers. They didn't have the Danish um, scientists ex uh, experience, that's for sure. So independent selection of experts would help address that. And thirdly, Peter mentioned it, the establishment of a post-appeals mechanism. So when all of your appeals um, mechanisms have been exhausted, um, a mechanism where there is fresh evidence uh, to enable cases to be reconsidered. Again, thresholds would need to be met. You can't leave every case open forever. Other countries like the UK have introduced a Criminal Cases Review Commission for this very purpose. They're effective. They exist in many other countries around the world, but not in Australia. I just want to acknowledge the extraordinary work that Carola Vinwaisa continues to do around the world. Um, unfortunately, she is one of those scientists who has spent a good part of her career in Australia and has now been snapped up by the UK and we let her go. 
Um, so Carola Vinuesa is unstoppable and she is uh, continuing her work trying to bring about reform so that full genomic sequencing is part of uh, processes, particularly where there are unexplained deaths um, and particularly amongst children. Um, so she's, she's getting some traction there. She's also um, been involved in a range of cases, often grouped um, or, or called around um, a mu Mucinson syndrome by proxy. These are mothers who um, often have, well, have children who have un undiagnosed illnesses and uh, they seek second opinions and seek to um, better understand what's going on. And they're so proactive in that uh, that often they are then accused of being um, abusive through that uh, giving of attention to that child. But it's, only, it's often a case of um, that child's illness being undiagnosed or difficult to diagnose. Um, there are many children who have been taken out of the care of their parents because of this. Um, and, and she's looking at shedding light on, on this sort of thing and helping lots of mothers around the world. She's um, a force of nature and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful advocate and, and um, scientist. So uh, here's to Corolla. Um, wherever decisions are made, they need to be informed by evidence, including in our justice system. I'll stop there. It's my great, great privilege um, to introduce Tracy Chapman, Australia's wonderful friend, advocate, supporter. Um, and just an extraordinary human being. Over to you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. I feel very nervous. Um, <laughs> it's such an amazing building. It's such an amazing thing we're doing, and I'm grateful to be here, so thank you. I just wanted to start. Look, I, I often do really off-the-cuff structured, uh, unstructured stuff, and I got told that's what I should do tonight. But I've got a neurodivergent brain. <laughs> I'm not, not afraid to admit that. And I feel because I'm a bit tired lately, I'm going to give you something structured. But I was reading something the other day that I, I was trying to trace back in about 2007 when Kath had gone through a whole bunch of appeal stuff and things were quite insane from the legal perspective that, you know, I was kind of on the periphery and wasn't allowed in. And I, and I read it again the other day. And I just want to... Michael Kirby, who is a former justice of the High Court, back in 97, they were trying to get a Criminal Cases Review Commission, I think, put up in South Australia. And he said, and I'm just going to, there's a long paragraph here, but I'm, I'm not going to go into that um, because this sort of sets the scene of where I'm going tonight. The desire of human minds for neatness and finality is only sometimes eclipsed by the desire of human minds for truth and justice. I just want you all to think about that. It's, you know, to me, I just kind of went, oh my goodness, you know, this is a really senior judge and this is what he has to say. So on this journey, I've been with some of the most remarkable people and I still have to pinch myself. Every day I pinch myself and I'm so grateful that these people did the right thing. But if you've got someone at this high level also feeling that way, I think it's up to each of us to behave way, way better in our working lives in, you know, everything we do professionally. I often wonder if that had happened at the beginning of this case when, you know, I couldn't believe it when I was listening to all the media stuff with Kath when, when she was going through the trial. I was heavily pregnant. I'm, um, I'm not going to go into all the details of what was going on in my life at the time and you, you will find out about it eventually. But at the moment, I just couldn't believe it when I was watching the television every night and they're talking about this woman's diaries we all knew Kath wrote diaries from when we were in primary school. And what they were interpreting was just nonsensical to us. And yet there was nobody willing to stand up for her in the original trial. And yet it became one of the key pillars of evidence in the circumstantial case against her. That was really disturbing. It lit a fire in me that just didn't go out until I did a happy dance at the second inquiry, sobbed openly in front of the, the actual um, justice that was overseeing it and felt this amazing sense of relief because finally, for me, the truth came out. So for the past 20 years, I've stood for my friend, Kathleen Folbig, a woman who was once considered Australia's most hated woman, Australia's worst serial killer, 
they called her openly a rock spider, which is a horrible term for children killers. It's just the most disgusting thing. Um, but through all that noise and the accusations and the venom, I, along with a small group of friends, Megan, Alana, I'm not sure if they're listening tonight, but we all hung in there, our close friendship and a handful of other people believed in something far greater than the stories told about Kath. We actually believed in the truth and that's why we kept going for all these years. Our journey has been a lonely one. For years, we felt like we were shouting into the void, fighting a battle that seemed impossible to win. The weight of public opinion and the label of monster mother that Kath was given made our mission pretty insurmountable at times. But true friendship isn't about standing by someone when it's easy. I don't think so anyway. It's about standing by them when it's really, really hard. When the world tells you, you walk away. And even my parents used to tell me to walk away because I've forgotten my career for this. And when you know in your heart that those people deserve your support and nobody else is there. So our resolve was often tested and the darkness of doubt would often creep in, telling us what we were trying to do was pretty impossible, <laughs> and it really was. But then one day after celebrating Peter's 60th birthday, a wonderful woman named Carola Vinuesa gave me a call and she told me something I couldn't believe. I, I was sitting, I was at my farm feeding out my horses and she's called me excitedly and when Carola's excited, she speaks at a million miles an hour and I'm really struggling to hear what she's got to say. But she's telling me that there's some really amazing people out there. They're really accomplished and they're actually willing to look at the case and maybe even help. And I just went, oh, my goodness. So there was a flicker of hope. But it was tempered by caution, pretty sadly, that comes from being, you know, going through years of being let down by people that said they would help you. And too many times we've encountered those that spoke loudly, promised lots, but actually delivered very little for us. However, this time was different. This time we were met by a group of individuals who not only said what they meant, but they actually did what they said they were going to do, and I was really grateful for that. And they've become known as our League of Luminaries. So, and I count Kath's awesome legal team, Rani and Robert and Greg. I know Rani's listening tonight. Love you, Rani. Um, yeah, in that League of Luminaries. So these weren't just experts. These people were real visionaries. And so tonight I'm sort of taking on a journey. I know we've looked at the big picture, but I really want to look at the characters of some of the people, the characteristics that you have to have to actually bring some, pull something like this off, you know. Um, these people truly were visionaries. They showed me that true collaboration really looks pretty good when it works, a collaboration that goes beyond mere teamwork and enters a realm of deep connection where every member's worldview, expertise and experiences enriches all our collective effort. The way this team worked together was structured but it was pretty effortless, which surprised me because usually it's the hardest thing to get teams to work together. I don't know, how do you all feel about that? <laughs> I, I find it's pretty difficult at times. Um, so, yeah, it was a form of collaboration, as I said, that I've never experienced before, a collaboration that led to breakthrough innovations on so many levels. And Professor Hill from Harvard University, and I'm a bit of a uh, in my former life, I was a management and leadership teacher and it's a passion of mine, so, I, uh, you know, I always go back to the text. But Professor Hill from Harvard refers to this as collective genius and I think we had collective genius. We operated on an open loop system where our emotions, thoughts and energies were all in sync, which I thought was a beautiful thing. And I, um, sorry, I'm just thinking, have I lost my place there? No. Neuroscientists have shown that when we work in such harmony, our limbic system, that's the part of our brain that governs emotion, actually lights up. And I like to think that, in essence, we were catching feelings from each other, which I think is kind of warm and fuzzy. Maybe neuroscientists are all thinking it's a bit, mm. but to me, I thought it was kind of cool. As leaders, you know that the emotions you bring to your organisations ripple out and they actually impact everyone around you. And our team was no different. The emotionally intelligent leaders in this group 
had a unique ability to create a shared understanding of the complexities, and there were a lot of complexities of the Folby case, the intricacies of the science, the legal entanglements, and the humanity at the core of this. This allowed us to collaborate across boundaries and engage with science and society globally. And even now, nearly a year post Cass's exoneration, the interest and conversations continue to grow in the media and I'm always getting calls, which that makes me really happy. I was humbled and deeply grateful that the remarkable individuals were willing to help us. This wasn't about just telling Cass's story. I always said to Kath, this is not your story. So it wasn't, to me, it was more than telling her story because this story was never meant to be hers as far as I was concerned. This was about rewriting a narrative, about ensuring that justice was served and that the whole truth, including those damn diaries, prevailed. For the first time, I felt vindicated. These incredibly skilled, well-connected, high-profile individuals were standing beside us willing to be counted, and that was amazing. And for the first time, I actually felt hope, and that felt pretty good. So hope was scarce after this disheartening inquiry of 28, 29. I can't tell you how stressed I was at that inquiry. Um, and it started pretty well straight away. I found out, I think it was the 18th of August, that we were getting an inquiry, and about a month later, I find that Blanche and, and Finesse are in a room with a whole bunch of barristers and they're all discussing the diaries and saying, oh, I'd really like to hear from Kathleen Folbig, see what she's got to say about the diaries. When I read that, I went psycho because I thought, you're asking a woman in trauma to talk about the, the, the things that she's written that she doesn't even remember really. And it was just her way of purging things that were on her mind and she's always said that. So hope was scarce after this inquiry, but we were going to free Kathleen and overturn her convictions as far as I'm just concerned, and so off we went. This experience taught me much about what it means to be a good leader. It's reinforced the importance of ethical behaviour, and there's no, I have a T-shirt that says ethical is the new black. It has reinforced that, in, that importance to me. The Australian Academy of Science, under the leadership of Anna Maria Arabia, Professor Doug Adish and Professor Shine, served as prime examples of what it means to be a humane leader, as far as I'm concerned. And as an example, I used to call them chief translation officers. I loved it because they were bridging that gap between complex science and evidence in the legal system, and they were supported by the most extraordinary team in Paul and Dan and so many others behind them that just got that out there. And I hope this case inspires you all to adjust your own worldviews, to reassess who you are and what you're willing to see and do in this rapidly changing world. I hope it encourages you all to expand your concepts of caring beyond yourself, your family and your work, to encompass many other things other than that. I also put in here sentient beings, but I'm an environmental scientist and I reckon I could get away with that. Um, I can't help myself, sorry. We must become solutionaries, conscious change agents. This is more than just an idea. I want it to in ignite inspiration that leads to action. No more words, action. Leaders who are strong at connection can see what's happening within this sphere of influence. They can simplify complexity and make sense of it in a way others can understand. And in this case, we also had GRA Cosway working alongside us to exemplify, um, to exemplify this. The expertise of Cosmos magazine in breaking down complex science into simple terms everyone could understand was also invaluable. We didn't attack entrenched beliefs because that would have alienated people and especially the media because, you know, they were so pro um, keeping Kath in jail for a long time. I know that sounds bad to say that. But the legal system and the general public, we, we kind of inspired new alternative views, new beliefs, framing everything around the importance of caring. And I loved that. Caring about evidence-based science, about legal and political process, the mother and the children at the heart of this case, and how the media could reframe the case from fear to, for, from fear to trust and from guilt to innocence. I've never really thought about this before, but I realised the other day in thinking about this that the solution to overturning this case, the secret source, if you will, actually um, to freeing and exonerating Kath and giving children an honourable epitaph 
was always in the explanation. So as a gift, if you will, to you all, based on key lessons that I've learned from my involvement in this case for the last 20 years, I, were, I really want you all to be courageous by establishing open, transparent and honest communication. I want you all to lead with humility, if I can ask, with others in mind. I want you to respect dignity and well-being, cultivate high levels of cognitive empathy, integrity and kindness. Influence without control, harness the collective wisdom and move away from the typical ego-driven hierarchical approaches that I'm sure you're all part of right now. I want you to all learn to work collaboratively, ethically, with integrity, empathy, truth, true and genuine humility and kindness at the heart of every decision you make. If we can achieve this, then every cost and every significant loss that I've personally had to experience, and I can't speak for anyone else, but I can tell you now, I'm genuinely broke and I have no career, um, in advocating this case, that's worth it to me. Be the best humane beings you can be. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. I want you to say every day, it is up to me. It's up to each of you to be the very best humane beings you can be. And just in closing, a dear friend of mine passed away last week and I'd just like to recognise the work of journalist Jane Hansen who passed away after her two-year battle with cancer. Jane's being buried on Thursday tomorrow and um, Jane was one of the most talented, committed and professional journalists that I have known. Brave, really brave. She's a plain speaker, honest and held integrity at the core of everything she did. She worked on the Mother's Guilt podcast, and if you haven't heard it, I'd really like you all to have a listen. Her impartial articles on the case were invaluable in our journey towards justice for Kath. Her dedication and passion has always, I'm sorry, has made a significant impact, and I can't thank her enough for that. Vale Jane Hansen. Thanks so much. So we're going to now have a bit of a chat together with the three speakers who you've already met, of course, Anna Maria, Peter, and Tracy, and invite a, uh, a wild card, if you will, in the form of uh, Professor David Balding. I'll let you slide behind me. Um, a statistical geneticist with a long history of giving expert evidence in the courts of Australia and in the UK and other countries. He wasn't involved in Kathleen's case, but he has advised on a lot of issues relating to statistics and probabilities in court, as well as um, the evaluation of DNA profile evidence. So really relevant to kind of the broader implications, I suppose, of Kathleen's case. So now we're just going to have a super chill, um, intimate chat with all of our podcast mics. <laughs> um, and then there will be time for questions from, from you here in the physical audience and then also via uh, the internet as well. Um, but given that we haven't yet had a chance to, to hear from you, David, I'd love to get a sense from, I think when we're thinking about the legal system and when we're thinking about science, we are thinking about evidence and, and truth and we say that we want things to be evidence-based, but how does that actually work in practice in a legal setting? Uh, yes, well, that's a big uh, it's a big question, but I do want to tell you a little bit about my experience with DNA profile evidence, which is my main area of expertise, because I think it's relevant. And just highlight, Anna Maria showed you a headline about oh, the chances of four babies dying in one family is one in a trillion or something. Of course, the number is nonsense. There are you know there are uh, there are instances of this occurring around the world, although of course it's extremely rare. But even if that number were true. What does it mean for the guilt of a defendant? Uh, and I just this is really important. There are so many cases that involve these kind of rare events, you know, coincidences, and there's a whole kind of legal theory of coincidence, but it, it just gets it wrong on a lot of matters. Now, going back to the DNA profile evidence, when it came in three decades ago, it was very controversial, uh, and, um, and, and I was just starting my career at that time, and I was sort of in right from the start, and there were, you know, there were a lot of confusion and you know, a lot of passion in the debate and so on, but eventually over time, I think we kind of 
figured it out. And we know there is a kind of science of weighing evidence, which is now routinely used for DNA evidence, and it hasn't got into other parts of the legal system. And, and we think it should, just like there's the, the kind of reading wars going on in Victoria about, you know, the science of reading, you know, it's just taken decades to get there. So the science, the one in a trillion, even if it's true, it doesn't really mean anything on its own. There are a lot of rare events happen, you know, the rarity of event on its own doesn't really say anything. Uh, what the, the, the kind of scientific approach to evaluating evidence is, how likely is this evidence if the prosecution is right? How likely is this evidence if the defense is right? So if the prosecution is right, um, sorry, if the defense is right that these are all, uh, you, you, know, you know, non, you know, deaths, kind of innocent deaths, then that's an extremely unlikely event. But also on the other side, it's also an extremely unlikely event. You know, all of the uh, all of the circumstances of the case, uh, for you know, for all kinds of reasons, the fact that there was no real tangible incri incriminating evidence, um, uh, and uh, the, the 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 you know, there the are just many circumstances we could go into that makes it extremely unlikely. And so, sort of my uh, you know interest in these kinds of cases is try and get people think you've got to think about both sides. Just the, the unlikeliness of the event on its own doesn't tell you very much. You've got to weigh it up. It's unlikely under this case, but it's also unlikely on the other case. And it's got to be much more unlikely uh, under, the, under the defense case. In other words, much more likely under the prosecution case, hugely more likely to get a, a conviction beyond reasonable doubt. So um, I... I was studying and then working in the UK during Kathleen's case, so I wasn't even, I, uh, you know, oh, uh, oh, aware of it at the time. But we have had many, you know, uh, experience of of many kind of similar cases where this coincidence evidence going. And if we could, if we could just get uh, pe people to accept this, and it is actually routinely done with DNA evidence now. It is a, uh, you know, how likely is this DNA evidence if it came from the accused? How likely is this DNA evidence if it came from someone else? The one must be much greater than the other to get a convincing uh, and, and a convincing case. And we, and, and in, in Kathleen's case, it's clear, you know, obviously I've now read quite a lot about it. It's just astonishing in retrospect how little real evidence there was. We heard from Tracy about the diary evidence that really doesn't amount to very much. But also people can't get their heads around this rareness of four deaths in one family. And, and that also doesn't amount to much on its own. I mean, possibly the prosecution could have made a case, but they didn't. Uh, and um, so, yeah, that's, that's just my, my, my contribution to, 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 to this. And I think that comes up in many other cases. We have our own, uh, you know, many of the great miscarriages of justice involve deaths of children because they involve passion, uh, you know, great passions. And we have our own in Victoria, the case of Robert Farquharson, who's still in jail that many of us think uh, uh, shouldn't be there. And it's another one involving deaths of multiple children. And again, this coincidence principle played a big role in that. And it, it's not really thought clearly. And, you know, there is a science of doing it properly. And we just got to get this uh, promoted more widely in the system. That's that's what I'm trying to do. Yep. Yeah, I want to follow up on that because we've heard about science communication Usually when I'm thinking about science communication, I'm thinking about like, how do I tell little kids how far away a star is? But this is like at real life and death, death stuff, especially when you're, when a jury is involved, are there some principles that you have seen work or is there a shift in how people are, are trying to make these communications given that this is super complicated stuff? This isn't something that people have a reference point for. Yes. Well, um, again, I've I've spent I had a lot of experience, many many trials, standing up in fr in juries, trying to con exp uh, convey this uh, complex uh, DNA evidence. Actually, you know, unlike many scientists who don't like giving evidence, I did, you know, I did quite like it, and I convinced my <laughs> uh, and I, I I rapidly got enough experience that the that the the you know, the, 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 the legal people on the other side didn't uh, challenge me too much. You know, I was treated pretty much with respect most of the time, I'm, pretty, I'm pleased to say. And I, and I managed to persuade myself that I was explaining things to the jury, but it is hard to get for the principles around this. Uh, and of course, you never know, you, you don't get a chance to interview jurors, although uh, I don't know if 
this is allowed, but actually in one case, because I, you know, my university affiliation was given, so in one case a jury rang me up afterwards to tell me what the jury deliberations had been, which was quite interesting, but uh, I didn't even get her name because I thought it was probably improper. That, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I have any, you know, I think it can be done. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are some good people out there who can, who can do it well, but I, I'm not sure if I have any really uh, uh, good, uh, good principles. But I do try and do, you know, this kind of, you know, how likely is it on this side and how likely on that side and do, and, and do a few kind of illustrative ideas, you know, what if there's a million people out there that could have been the source of the DNA, then this is what the outcome would be, you know, those kind of uh, illustrative. And, and, and I feel you, you, you can do it, but it's difficult, yeah. Anna Maria, I'm not sure if it was entirely unprecedented, but it was definitely incredibly rare that the Academy came out so strongly. What got you over the line with it and what were the deliberations that happened within that group to decide that, yeah, this is this is something we're going to really hang our hats on? Look, we've not surveyed every learned academy across the world, but we do believe it might be rare if not the only case where a learned academy has played a role such as the one we played in the Kathleen Folby case. Um, the scientific evidence that was shown and shared with us by Carola Vinwaysa, who did not do all of the science but gathered 27 experts from 11 countries across the world and published their evidence in Peer, in a very high quality peer reviewed journal, um, really with the leaders, the pioneers in the field of calmodular mutations and all, all and everything that means, that evidence was so compelling. It wasn't a case of, oh, you know, it's a bit grey here, we're not quite sure. Um, those that publicate, there was one publication in, in particular, but there were others that supported it. Um, of, of all of the people who were asked to sign the petition, that was shared with them, and no one said, oh, look, I'm not sure I wouldn't put my name to this. So in some ways it was so compelling that it wasn't that hard to get people over the line. Um, they backed the science. They were there because they backed the science. And myself um, and certainly those who backed that petition did not know of the other circumstances that Peter shared with you today starting in 2003. And nor should they, you know, that was separate, had no idea of the conflicts of interest you described and some of the other wrongdoings. The science itself spoke so loudly and uh, people willingly, scientists, uh, Nobel laureates, very distinguished people in our country uh, were willing to sign that petition. This is obviously super recent. We're talking about last year, but would you worry that it would open the floodgates or have you had other approaches by other people in similar situations? Yes, I have received correspondence from people in jail since. <laughs> um, all, all sorts of cases have been put to us. Um, I've got to say, um, you know, Kathleen in some ways was is the unluckiest person ever, but also the, the luckiest um, because the, the, the resources, people and approach that was pulled together through Team Folbig was extraordinary, but it shouldn't take that to deliver justice. And it's not something that you can just pick up and activate and then apply to all of the other cases that might come forward. It would need a team of thousands to be able to get through them all. And it's not the role of the Australian Academy of Science. For, for me, this was an important demonstration case. It was one that was very clear in that science had not been heard at that first inquiry. Um, scientists had been treated appallingly, frankly. Um, and so that needed to be corrected. And if science was heard and the second inquirer had decided that she remained guilty, well, so be it, science was heard. Um, but we weren't satisfied that it was heard in the first inquiry and we weren't going to give up until it was. And it was, and the outcome speaks for itself. It's funny you say that. When Peter was speaking before, it's incredibly inspiring and it also feels ridiculous how many resources went into this case and it still took years and years. Peter, like a reflection on, I suppose, equity of how you learn from a case like this and then also like make it streamlined because – it shouldn't have to take one of the most well-connected men in Australia and a team of PR people and years and years and years and a lot of money um, for justice to be done. Well, no, it shouldn't. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but we discovered that it did. <clears throat> um, uh, in fact, uh, when um, Kathleen was uh, released, uh, I was there for the press conference and the Attorney General <clears throat> made the comment that this was a, uh, a tribute to the capability of the New South Wales justice system that uh, it worked so well um, that Kathleen could be released. And uh, I had the chance to get up afterwards and I said, yep, yeah, sure, everybody's got access to $3 million, the former CEO of PBL, the best, the best, the best PR team in the country, the finest legal mind in the Academy of Science. Sure. You know, I mean, there was something um, clearly uh, wrong about it. But um, my, my um, Corolla was my CEO, um, and I knew how incredibly competent uh, she is. Um, she asked me to become her chairman because, in her genetic studies, one of her core areas is lupus, and my uh, my sister died of lupus, and so I very happily supported um, uh, Corolla and provided scholarships to ANU to support it. And so when somebody of that quality that you know in that context sits down and says, Peter, just read this transcript, uh, and as I said before, um, I just couldn't believe how a scientist was treated um, in an inquiry. This is not, you know, I was the acting chairman, uh, Rupert and uh, Kerry Packer decided to make me the acting chairman of OneTel. Um, and so therefore I spent quite a bit of time being uh, interrogated in the OneTel um, uh, matter. <clears throat> now, that was people lost, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions in fact. That's one issue. But, but Corolla um, just gave the science as it is and if you read the way she was treated in that, in that context, you say something is wrong here. And, and, and in fact, that was what really got me going, right? And sure, I mean, I'm very fortunate uh, that through my career, um, through the, 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 the role I played at Macquarie Bank and, uh, and then PBL, uh, that I, yeah, I, I do have access to um, a, a large number of people. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes when you realise that Kathleen was treated like she was is because those people that did knew she had access to almost nobody. And she had access to Tracy and her close friends, but she had access to almost nothing. She was a completely downtrodden, her father was uh, convicted of murder. Um, she was a completely downtrodden, out of sorts woman um, who, who could be easily picked on. You know, and the system did that to her. Um, and, and sometimes in life, uh, when you've been given the privilege uh, of access, which I do, and the privilege of power, which I have from time to time, uh, it's not that you're giving back. That's not the right language. It's that, it's that I was given the opportunity to use my skills and capabilities to help Kathleen get out. And I'm incredibly grateful to her for that opportunity that was given to me. Um, and yes, I used my resources um, to help Kathleen get out. But at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, it was partly, no, it was significantly because how terrible is it that the system of the scale of the New South Wales judiciary and the prison system decided to completely and comprehensively trash a beautiful individual because they could. Um, and, and that upset me deeply. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I, I remember, sorry to keep going, when I was with Tracy, uh, I was actually went up to Tracy, uh, um, to, I was gonna spend the weekend there, and I went up the Friday, and we didn't know that Kathleen was going to be released, and, uh, and so was he planned to be there. So I actually, Tracy and I had a visit planned with Kathleen. And she'd actually been released on the Monday. And we were there on Saturday morning, and, and Kathleen and, and Tracy and I having a, a breakfast. And I got this text message from the New South Wales prison system to say, Peter, <coughs> uh, your pity eights, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> visitor number, blah, blah, blah. Uh, where are you? Because you, are, you have booked an appointment with Kathleen Folbig, and you have to be there one hour in advance in the prison, right? And, and, and I shared this with Kathleen, and Kathleen goes, oh my goodness, we need to get in the car, Tracy. And, 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 and I go, why? She goes, well, I can't miss my appointment with Peter Yates. <laughs> I mean, how crazy. And, and, and then when she came out, she had no identity, she had an identity taken off her. So I had to call up uh, the Prime Minister's office to get her an identity. She couldn't get a bank account. So I called up the CEO of, of, uh, of the ANZ to get her a bank account. Now, I also learned something else. 
it must be incredibly difficult to be a prisoner that is released without somebody to help you because the system makes your life miserable. Uh, and so that was the second piece of the puzzle that I discovered. I have so many questions I want to ask, but I feel like I'm hugging the microphone. And I know that you have questions as well. So if you do have a question, throw your hand in the air. I know we've also got some questions coming through on Zoom, but we'll prioritise the, uh, the warm bodies in the room first. Uh, Don Williams, yeah, terrific presentation, just uh, inspiring. Uh, just to be a bit provocative, think about the role of juries. Um, a murder trial is an inherently adversarial uh, uh, event. Both sides are trying to win and to uh, you know, defeat the other side, not find the truth. Um, if you have science, it may well be fiercely contested. If we have a situation where you've got what well, might be very abstruse science being prevented, it's uh, being presented, it's been contested very fiercely. Uh, do we have to think about how the role of the jury in this, um, you know, I, I've sort of heard of in the past where there's sort of tricky science, it's sort of judge only sort of trials. So just based on your experience in this case, do we have to really think a little bit about the role of juries in these types of cases? There'll be cases that require juries and uh, mostly, I think generally speaking, um, judges and juries are ill-equipped to deal with the rapidly changing scientific and technological advances before us. So, you know, we've spoken about DNA evidence and, and genetic evidence, but think about um, uh, litigation related to climate change, related to AI, related to quantum. Now. I hope we can select members of the public who are well across all of these matters, but my sense is that that's not going to be the case. So it will become ever more important to have very accurate, meaningful and accessible science communication to those people making decisions, that's judges and jurors, to put them in the best position place to be able to draw a conclusion. And sometimes that material will be grey, it will be uncertain. Scientists have no problem at all dealing with uncertainty. If it is presented in a way where the boundaries of that evidence are well described, where uh, you know margins of error are described, the level of certainty we have around evidence and material presented is well described, you equip and empower decision makers to make a best possible decision with the available evidence. At the moment, that's not happening. So I, I don't think we should do away with jurors. I don't think we should do away with judges. Mm -hmm. Our system mostly works for us, but we do need to be able to give them the most accurate and accessible information with all of the parameters around it, around the certainty with which they can take that information. If I could just add one comment there, it's important also in this case to distinguish between um, a trial, which is a judicial process, and an inquiry, which is a process of the executive of government. It's actually not a judicial process. Um, and in the trial, there was almost no, um, there was almost no scientific evidence even asked for. Um, the evidence was, did Meadows Law work, or effectively, um, and did she, uh, uh, did she basically, through her di diaries, um, uh, 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 um, confess? And that was the extent of the, uh, of, of the scientific evidence. That's, it was in the first inquiry that the scientific evidence was first presented, and an inquiry is not a judicial process. The purpose of an inquiry is to is inquire information, but the way it was run, it was run as if it was the prosecution's, um, uh, uh, the prosecu so, that, so the DPP's um, uh, 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 scientists versus uh, those scientists that were put up by Kathleen Fall, big site. And that's when it, 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 it moved around. The other comment that I would make, and I've had this experience myself because I was a foreman in a criminal trial. Um, and the, the, unfortunately, the legal representation for, uh, for the defendant was so poor uh, that I put my hand up to the judge and I said, uh, Your Honour, are we allowed to ask questions? And he goes, yeah, you're the foreman. I didn't know that, but in Victoria, if you're the foreman, you're allowed to ask questions. And we only, I only asked one question and we were all shepherded out because the, basically the case collapsed immediately. <laughs> And, and I was trying to think, well, well, hang on, this poor defendant's got a barrister and a team. And of course, you know, legal aid doesn't get you, you basically doesn't get you what you probably need. Um, and, and one question by a foreman in, in a criminal trial basically undermined the entire case. 
and I still to this day can't understand how the legal team supporting uh, the defendant hadn't even asked that same question. My name's Kerry Q. I think I'll be addressing this question to Tracy because you've followed the case all the time. Um, Professor Roy Meadows was struck off from the UK register in 2005. Um, that was for a case where Sally Clark, who was a UK lawyer, was accused of suffocating her two babies who died of SIDS and was jailed for three years until the Royal Statistical Society, who knew there was such a society, came up and uh, protested to his, at, to his incorrect use of statistics. Now, um, an old lad that Sally Clark died, was released after three years and died of alcoholic poisoning in 2007. But the question is, um, could you use that information that he was struck off? If that information was used as some sort of scientific basis, he was struck off the register in the UK. Did you get a chance to do that? Well, I think that's the interesting thing. Um, I annoyed the hell out of every single legal team that was <laughs> ever um, involved in Kath's case initially. But I, I was not Kath's, um, uh, what do you call it, um, I've got the word in my head and I can't think of it right now, uh, legal guardian. So basically any questions that I put forward didn't have to be met with any answers really. So, um, yeah, I was really annoying, asked lots of questions similar and even gave lots of newspaper cuttings about that and many other things, um, but voiceless at the end of the day. Um, yeah, it, it's a complex thing. But, I mean, too, what I've realised, um, when you go through appeals processes too, you bloody well, excuse the language, but get it right at the trial because whatever comes thereafter is, is the truth and that's what you're trying to actually overturn. Whatever that is becomes the thing that you're fighting. I, I, I couldn't believe... When I heard all of st the stuff about the diaries, for example, at trial, and as I said, I couldn't be at the trial because um, I was very ill at the time and that's a whole other matter. And anyway, it wouldn't have made any difference because the outcome was the outcome. But I was most shocked to find that people like Professor James Pennebaker, who, you know, I ask when we finally get, because we, we didn't want to do a second inquiry, to tell you the truth. I don't know whether you guys actually ever knew that, but Kath and I... Oh, they tell us. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted a pardon. <laughs> we did. We just wanted a pardon. But Kath and I, you know, we, we used to talk every day and we had great lengthy conversations, sometimes, you know, 10 phone calls talking about this stuff really robustly. You know, you got initially in the early days, we had six minute phone calls, so we can talk real fast. But then we got 15 minute phone calls. But these were really, really heavy things. You know, you've got this amazing legal team with Rani and Robert and everything. But we were, this time around for the inquiry, we, we were shocked at how Kath was treated and, and the nonsensical garbage that came out of the first inquiry. You know, the, the, the people that were standing up asking her questions about diaries weren't even psychologists. They, had, they, were, they were some legal team members. What would you know about scientific, you know, evidence in terms of diaries? I mean, I was just sitting there. The amount of times I had to almost... Like I was screaming into my bag. I was so angry. But so my point here is that what you, you know, what is my point really? Sorry, I'm just thinking, I'm sort of jumping. This is my neurodivergent brain. It goes too fast. But in terms of this, you only have limited capacity to do stuff, right? And the outcome for the trial meant that the truth was that Kath killed her children and the diaries were the truest form of evidence that said she did it. Garbage to me, like absolute garbage. We find then that we get an inquiry and when I think that perhaps we might actually get some experts in the room, we get three days of some of the worst cross-examination I have ever seen in a courtroom. And if you haven't heard it, it's all online. Do yourself a favour, go and listen to it. I'm sure your toes will curl. It was disgusting. So you've got that and then, you know, you get Blanche that says he's even more convinced that she's guilty now. And Kath and I just went, how, how does this happen? So we actually had a really robust conversation about whether we were going to go. 
It was just that the diaries were brought in this time because they go, hey, that's technically new evidence, right? If you actually stuffed up and didn't do it the right way the first time, then if you're going to do it the right way, bring it in, then, then that's new evidence, isn't it? So we were really happy that Cass legal team then brought it in and then we were able to bring in some of these other cases and actually have real conversations about this stuff and bring in the truth. Can, can, I, can I just uh, add just quickly uh, directly to that, that uh, um, my, my understanding is that, you know, Me Meadows Law has been completely discredited many times and I don't think it was overtly relied on in Kathleen's case, but it's one of those things that just never dies, no matter how many times it's discredited. It's lurking in the back of the, of the minds, I think, yeah. And I actually, can I just add to that? One of the biggest questions I'm asked all the time, and I've been, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of online questions is, yeah, but what's the chance of that actually happening? Yes. Uh, Always, even now even now. If you have a genetic mutation, pretty high, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Batchelard. I'm a journalist and I'm covering the Robert Farquharson case at the moment and I have a podcast and so forth. Uh, so I'm very interested in this topic. Uh, and I, I wanted to direct a question probably to Peter uh, about, it's almost a political question. Um, it's, I'm told it's extremely difficult uh, to get compensation uh, for a wrongful conviction in most states in Australia, and particularly in Victoria, where they fight the, these cases very hard. Um, and now the, the government in Victoria is seeking to legislate to rule out compensation for anybody who's been wrongfully convicted as part of the Gobbo uh, problems. Uh, simply, I, I, get, I guess, because the, the defendants there are very unpopular people. But the question, my question is, should there be uh, a wrong, some kind of uh, uh, compensation or, or, or de jure uh, um, fallout or, or, or pushback against a wrongful conviction when the system's got it wrong, particularly if it's shown, for example, that the police did target uh, the, the person who's been convicted and so forth. Uh, it's my view that, that that would give some kind of... Uh, uh, some, it would deter uh, wrongdoing in the justice system from the police up through the prosecution. Uh, and at the moment, it seems like there isn't much deterrence against, uh, against wrongful convictions. Uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, the proposal that's been put forward um, in the Gobbo case that um, uh, nobody can be prosecuted or no compensation can emerge um, I, I believe in a liberal democratic society um, and I believe that we all have uh, the right of law and due process and the suggestion uh, that the state would interfere with that right is absolutely appalling. Now, the problem we have with states, as you know, is there is no constitution and there are no human rights uh, in each state. Um, and if the state of Victoria voted, for the Put Peter Yates to Death Act. Not that I'm advocating that they do that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, as you know, they, they can do that. So, so, so um, the crown in a state is absolutely all powerful. Uh, the idea that our crown, um, the state of government of Victoria would use that as they're proposing in the Gobbo case is absolutely appalling. And I believe that uh, the, the position that's been put by the, the opposition is the right one. And I think most fair-minded people would think the same. I mean, it's a form of communism, isn't it? I mean, really to say, I'm gonna take away your rights. That's what's being proposed. Um, it's really just absolutely shocking. Now, sure, um, you know, we might not like as taxpayers the amount that we're gonna have to pay, but if you do that wrong, then why should you as a government get off the hook? I mean, I can't. Um, the bigger issue is that you're right. Now, the Commonwealth has signed up an act, which is why uh, compensation is paid for wrongful, um, uh, uh, wrongful uh, um, uh, prosecution in federal territories, Canberra um, or the Northern Territory, which is where Lindy Chamberlain obviously was prosecuted under. Uh, the state governments have, uh, both Victoria and New South Wales, have steadfastly refused to have um, such an act. Uh, that doesn't mean that compensation hasn't been paid and doesn't mean the compensation won't be paid, but it's not, it's not governed by an act. As I understand it, you have to basically prove malicious prosecution. So you essentially have to prove corruption, uh, which is a very high bar. 
uh, that's partly correct. I appreciate that there will be many databases available uh, to many scientists on genetic disorders and that are updated and where uh, scientists will access and contribute to that knowledge base. Is there a, does that database, uh, is it expanded at all into the context of the legal system whereby cases that have been brought and linked to a genetic disorder and a consequence of that disorder, um, but written, as it were, in a language that would pass the law um, without, with providing the evidence, but without necessarily all of the science behind it, which is what exists for the scientists who are engaged in this world. So is there a database globally that as each case comes along that, uh, in a sense, does not appear to have a genetic base to it, where, uh, as evidence suggests that it is and that is proven or proven in a court of law, and is then put into that database so that lawyers can begin to access it through the eyes of the law rather than through, as it were, the genetic, completely the detail of the genetic science. I need to say that no, um, but it would be a tremendously useful uh, resource, I think, for the legal system, because as you say, it would be put in language that is accessible and understood in, in, in legal terms. Um, it's Whilst there's nothing that I'm aware of that is... Um, you know, that physically exists, I think there is growing evidence and the bringing together of that sort of information um, across genetic disorders. The International Calmogenopathy Register is kind of an example of that, but it's not presented in a legal way, um, although it is being interrogated increasingly um, by the law. Um, and in fact, the um, owner of that, or the director of that register was one of the witnesses at the Kathleen Folby at Second Inquiry, um, Professor Peter Schwartz. He was quite great actually um as a scientist he he stood there and said look i've got the numbers here <laughs> you know, he, and he spoke about having the numbers almost in political terms but um uh, but he, he was speaking about the genetic numbers of course mm. yeah that is where we have to oh sorry go no, on, go on. No, no, no. <laughs> no well I was, I was just going to say that i don't think there's anything systematic you know all the different disease areas have their own databases and there's nothing particularly tailored for the legal system you just have to rely on experts being able to communicate that in individual cases and it's and it is rather hit and miss yeah mm -hmm. AI could be your friend. It could. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That yeah. could be better. Although, again, you know, interpretation is the key, and so it may not be. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, just to acknowledge again that tonight would not have happened without the Royal Society of Victoria, obviously, the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, the Australian Academy of Science, Inspiring Victoria, National Science Week, and a particular shout out to Matthew Cuthbertson for bringing it all together. And of course, thank you so much to our incredible speakers, Peter Yates, Tracy Chapman, Anna Maria Arabia, and David Balding. Thank you.